I, I think we straight. Yes, yes, y'all. It's your boy DJ Cliff, man. It's another episode of DJ Cliff Presents. And, um, you know, just having the opportunity to sit down and chop it up with people that I, I obviously have a great respect for and people who've done some pretty amazing things. And so I am honored and privileged to be sitting here in the presence <laughs> of none other than Mr. DJ OG1. What's up, Cat? What's going on, my brother? Man, look, I'm good, bro. I'm just, uh, once again, I, I'm just grateful that you took a minute out of your busy schedule to just come and, you know, chop it up with, with little old me. <laughs> nah, you, you that dude, man. So anytime you give me the call, man, it's it's on. That's what's up. I appreciate it, man. Look, man, so much to get into. Um, I just, you know, for the, for, 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 for Jump, I just want to give folk an opportunity um, just to remind people of uh, who you are and, and, and what you do. So a lot of people in the Northwest may know that you are the official DJ of the Portland Trail Blazers. Right, correct. And then um, you also just finished up the season with the Portland Thunder. Correct. And then... Um, and then you just like you DJ all over the like all over the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. They, uh, you know, folk pe- keep me busy, man. That's what's I'm, up. I'm really blessed. Well, t- first off, let's let's talk about that, man. Let folk know how long you've been. How long you've been in the game? How long you been DJing? Whoo, I've been DJing, man, by a little over 25 years. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So you've seen changes in the game, for real. man. Major changes, major. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is got to be good and bad from everything from the um you know what djing has become to right. what folk used to to spin you know people have moved away from vinyl and 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 are now using some people still use vinyl obviously yeah. shout out to dj wicked but yes you know, some people choose not to what do you what, what do you use right now when you spin i do it all okay. i do it all um i understand you know i come from the vinyl the wax days and carrying crates and stuff and getting your fingernails all messed up for, you know from digging for hours and hours in the store uh, again shout out DJ Wicked yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, you know but um yeah i but i also um have seen the transition from when it went from vinyl to CDJs to uh even currently now where you know it's the digital stage and i always try to keep myself in a place where i've i've grown and i've challenged myself to be relevant and so even though my foundation is wax and I do gigs where it's just all vinyl, but I also understand that where the industry has moved. And so not to at least be knowledgeable enough to uh, understand the, the new technology and be able to apply it when needed is, is kind of, you know, kicking myself in the face if I didn't stay relevant. So I, I fluctuate between controllers, you know, my 1200s. I will never get rid of my 1200s. Yeah. Uh, CDJs, I, I do it all. So that way, whenever, whatever environment, whatever circumstances I end up in, I'm able to fluctuate where some people that are just the digital age, if the power went out, you know, or, or their computer broke down, they wouldn't know how to spin wax. Yeah. I can do both. No doubt. You know, fluidly. So, you know, I just stay on top of the game, man. That's what's up. That's what's up, DJ OG1. So, um, when I first, I think obviously I, I first knew of you just from seeing your name, like around town. Yeah. And then reached out to you, um, and you were kind enough years ago. Uh, to 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 do just like a quick little interview. I don't even know if right. you remember this. Oh, at, I remember at, at Platinum Records. Yeah, and one of the reasons that we connected there was because you were teaching a class, right, on DJing. So aside from aside from doing your thing as OG One, you also obviously reach out reach out to the community. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's very important. Uh, again, you know, you look at when you talk about just community. Period when you talk about it takes a village to raise a child. But I think that concept goes across the board in business and everything. And so I think it's very important for me to take whatever experiences and things I've experienced and and enhanced in in terms of my skill set to be able to pass that on to other people. I mean, if you want the quality of expertise to, you know, kind of continue or or, or tradition, you have to be able to pass that on. You can't just keep it to yourself and say, I don't don't want nobody else to be dope like me. Why not? Why do you want to be be better? You know, and so, you know, I really enjoy opportunities to be able to teach other DJs, uh, you know, hopefully they'll listen <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. Uh, but be able to pass that information on and be able to say man yeah I helped that person you know uh, you know step up their game yeah 
That's what's up. That's what's up. So, um, again, like I said, seeing your name around town, man, so many things that we could, so many directions we could go. <laughs> so I'm gonna I, and and a, a shout to wifey, man. When I when I told her yes. like, some of the stuff that you've done and and uh, she's like, oh, I know you're gonna talk about that. Yeah. So one of the first <laughs> one of the first um, groups that you had an opportunity to spin for. Ooh. The Kings from Queens. Man. Dude, you got to speak on that, bro. Man, How did that so, even come you know, about? well, you know, when I came to Portland, um, you know, I have a, you know, kind of backstory that got me to Portland. Uh, I don't know if you going to get in. Don't you even worry. But, <laughs> but part of my transition was, you know, I had stopped doing music a certain on a certain level when I transitioned from LA to Portland, just trying to get myself uh, grounded. Uh, so when I started DJing, I started uh, doing um, uh, after school uh, dances for a group of kids. Like uh, I remember at Whitaker Middle School, I used to do these dances uh, that were centered around grades. So all the kids that got good grades that quarter, I would say, if you got like a 3.0 and above, you were invited to the party. If you didn't get that, sorry, you you know. You missed out. Yeah. So I would do these parties, and the word just kind of got out, you know, about me DJing. And so um, I got a call one day from a, a sister, Sandra Wadsworth, who was a local promoter at the time. And she said, hey, you know, I've been hearing about you. I would like to, you know, try you out at you know, one of our shows. And so I had never DJed a concert. You know, I'm just house party, skate parties, that type of thing. And so I was like, oh, sure. You know, I'm just kind of like nonchalant. I said, what's the show? She said, oh, run DMC and Naughty by Nature. <laughs> and I just got silent. Yeah. I got silent on the phone, man. I'm thinking, okay, you, okay, you got me. This is a joke. <laughs> and I'm like, like, run DMC? Like, run DMC? <laughs> and she said, yeah, you know, oh, you, I mean, you're interested? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember going to the Rosalind. Yeah. And and I remember my hands sweating because I'm thinking, okay, this is the first concert I've ever done, yeah. and my first concert is Naughty by Nature and Run DMC. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Jam Master De Jay, what record do you, <laughs> how do you open for Jam Master Jay? Right. Like, really, how right. do you do that? Right, right, right. A, a, basically, a no-name person. Yeah. You're open up for Jam Master J. Yeah. What is the first record that you're going to put on for that crowd? Yeah. And I was so nervous. I mean, literally, I was like breaking out in sweat, yeah. like not knowing what I was going to do, man. And once I got on stage, I, I just went blank. Yeah. I just went blank. And next day, I know the crowd was, you know, raising their hands and, and having fun. Yeah. And I remember that moment when I was like, now, see, this is what it's all about, yeah. allowing people to escape, being a DJ and having the opportunity to play music that allows people in that moment to escape. This is what I want to do. Do you remember, do you remember the record? I can't remember the record. Oh. I blanked out. <laughs> I blanked out. All I remember is I had my head down and the, I dropped the record and people were just like going crazy. And I remember looking up. And then my head went back there, and I just went. I just went in. And I know it was just all, like, old school classics, classics and stuff, because that's what I grew up on. Right, right. And uh, I had fun, man. Ever since then, it was just word of mouth. I mean, every on pretty much every major show that came into the Roseland, you know, since then, since that time yeah. period, uh, I was on it. That's what's up. That's just that's that's just crazy, bro. Because you know, once again, I'm I'm, I'm an old head, so uh, <laughs> you know, to have an opportunity to to spend for Run DMC, it's like that's not, so. Did you get an opportunity to connect with them at all? Yeah, Why? yeah. I met Jam Master J. Run. Yeah. I mean, the coolest dudes, man. I mean, because again, I'm looking like I was. I mean, it was Run, you know, and them. But Jam Master J, I was just like blown away by that dude i was like i gotta meet this dude because right. he's doing what i want to do right, right. and he was just the coolest dude all them dudes was real super cool man i mean just what an what an amazing way to, to start i mean to really i guess get get into the professional yeah. side of what you do so then fast forward a number of years earlier this year you had an opportunity to spin for who i consider <laughs> the greatest lyricist ever <laughs> Rock him, the God MC oh, man. Oh my lord, man! Hey, I had an man. opportunity to, to meet him when he was here last yeah. year, 
And like, it's crazy because an artist who has been around as long as he has, who has done as much as he has, and I've told the story before, after the show, he hung out for like 45 minutes, just like talking to everybody, yeah. signing autographs, taking pictures, like super, super down to earth. But anyway, yeah. what, like, no, it's, that, no, man. you, you hit it right on, on the nail, man. I mean, again, when you get somebody like that, that you grew up with, you seen on album right. covers and you seen them rock, it's kind of like, okay, what is it going to be like to be around this type of dude? Yeah. You know, because I've been around a lot of guys that are in the game, Jay, all these guys, I've been around on stages and arenas with a lot of these guys. So, and I've seen the the aura around a lot of quote superstars. Yeah. But it is always a pleasure, man, when you get around someone who is well respected by young and old, yeah. and see that they don't have this this uh, sense of entitlement. Yeah. Or a sense of separation from the people, yeah. you know, and, and Rakim was, I mean, to me, it was like the essence of hip hop, man. This is what hip hop is supposed to be about, man. Not all the flash and all that stuff. To see that dude get on the stage, no hype, man. None of that, man. Just a mic in his hand and him on center stage and go in, man. It was like, see, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. This is, to me, the thing that is missing out of hip hop even today, man. Is that that energy. Yes, people are making money and all that stuff, but somewhere the craft has gotten lost in there. The energy and the innocence of hip hop, the rawness of it, like, no, it's just the mic and me. Yeah. I don't have to do a lot of extra stuff to get you to listen to what I got to say. He controlled the crowd, man. Yeah. He can it was like, man, it's it's crazy. Probably one of the best shows ever yeah. that I've I've rocked with, man. So 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 then you know it it brings back the question, where have we you know where did we lose it all? Because that doesn't I mean it, it it's it's so far and few between where you can see that happen again where you can see an MC take the stage, and 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 hold people's attention until they leave the stage. Yeah, is money it, is that what it is? It's money. I mean, you know, you hear the, the cliche statement about the, you know, money being the root of all it, but it's the love of it. It's not money itself. And so when you have artists whose drive is simply to make as much money as they can, that's where the craft gets lost. Because then you compromise. You compromise the essence of who you are to get that money yeah. as opposed to honing in your craft and staying who you are and let the money come to you. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that separates the greatest of MCs yeah. from just the rappers that are out today. It's like, what gimmicks and what what things can I put on to market myself to get the flash as opposed to someone really respecting my spit, my yeah. spit game. Right, right, right. You know, you know Rakim back then had the, the hairdo and all that stuff, yeah, yeah. but that's, what not, that's not what people remember about that dude. Not at all. That's not, <laughs> not at all. That's not what they, they remember. This dude, yeah, he got, but man, that dude spit. Yeah. Name a lot of rappers today, even the ones that's, that's supposed to be deep in the game right now in terms of money and financially set and all that stuff. What are people remembering about them? Are they remembering stories about them or their actual craft? Yeah. Yeah. That's deep. That's the truth. That's the truth. DJ OG one up in here just kicking knowledge. All right, so so in between that that first uh, event at the Roseland DJing for Run DMC and Naughty by Nature, and then just this year, man, you've done so much in between, just in terms of being a DJ. Crazy man. Um, we mentioned that you're the, you're the official DJ for the Portland Trailblazers, and then I know that you had the opportunity to um, DJ on more than one on a number of occasions for. You know who many people consider to be the greatest <laughs> basketball player to ever walk on the earth. Man, yeah. speak on what was it like to DJ for Rasheed man. Wallace? <laughs> you know it was so crazy. Nah, nah, Rasheed, Rasheed, Rasheed I'm a, I'm a is my boy. Rasheed. I'm a big Rasheed, fan of Rasheed is my nah. boy. And I rock with Rasheed. You know he he already know what it is. Uh, 
But, you know, MJ, man, uh, again, another, you know, not in the music game, but just being an athlete. You know, when I was younger, running track, playing hoops and stuff. And I actually met MJ uh, when I was a teenager working uh, in the summer for the Summer Pro League mm-hmm. uh, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I was, you know, whoa, that's MJ, right. like Michael Jordan when I was, you know, younger. But actually getting a chance to play for him. It was it was crazy, and I got to tell this quick story. No, yeah. A couple of days before, I was supposed to DJ his first uh, his birthday party. He was coming into Portland. It was around his birthday, and they wanted to have a little uh, private thing for him. And uh, a couple of days before, I tore my Achilles tendon. Oh snap! You know, just shooting around with a, a kid in the community, and uh, the doctor said, "Got to be off your feet. Right. Got to have surgery." Right. But I put me in the boot. Yeah. And said, you can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And I remember looking at the doc said, uh, I don't know what you got <laughs> to give me, wrap up, stitch up, right. whatever. I am not going to miss <laughs> DJing for Michael Jordan. Right. And he looked at me, he said, well, I don't recommend it. I was like, I know you don't recommend it, but I'm just telling you, if they got to roll me in on a stretcher, and I'm just putting my arms, elevating my arms over the turn. I'm, it's going down. And I remember rocking to his party uh, on crutches, That's on crutches, crazy, and him bro. cracking jokes at me, saying, "I, uh, you, you was playing basketball, wasn't you?" Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah." And he said, "You got to know your limits, man. You got to know your limits." <laughs> I'm looking at Mike like, man, I'm in pain, too. I'm looking at like, Mike, you don't know me like that. (laughs) But it was amazing, man. I mean, it was amazing. Again, being around somebody that is considered great like that and, you know, his attitude, I mean, was super cool, man. Came up, Greek took a picture. It wasn't on some, you know, other stuff. I mean, that was my experience. I don't know if other people experience other things. But, again, for me, it just kind of drilled in again the importance of relationships because I just didn't get that gig because, you know, I was the super best DJ in the entire planet. Mm -hmm. It was just being in the right place at the right time and having the right relationships with people who had enough confidence in me to knew that um, my level of professionalism and, uh, you know, the level, uh, my skill level in terms of my craft, you know, and respecting that and, and wanting that to be a part of the, of the experience. It's just, you know, again, I'm, I'm blessed, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think sometimes of all the people I've DJ for, uh, for from old school to, to new school, man, and just like, and knowing where I come from, yeah. I'm not supposed to be here, man. So every experience, man, I get to, you know, showcase who I am and, and what I'm about, man, is just a super blessing and a, a very humbling experience. No doubt, man. No doubt. I, you know, and I, I jokingly threw up Rasheed, but yeah, I mean, you've, re, you, you've DJ for Rasheed for a number of, of, mm-hmm. of trailblazers. Yeah. Um, like you said, for a number of artists, both in the hip hop circle, as well as the R and B circle. And so jazz, um, jazz the whole yeah, deal. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Farnell Newton. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know that y'all Mike do the Philly, things. Yeah. I mean, um, you've really, you've really sort of touched on so many different genres of music, and and touched so many different people's lives. When you got into DJing, I mean, was that was that what you aspired to do? Was it to be on that level? Well, when I first got into it, man, it was just the love of music, and I knew I wanted to be a part of music expression. And when I was younger, I didn't know how that was going to play out because my father was a musician. I played guitar, piano, all that stuff when I was younger, but it was circumstances that didn't allow me to hone in on those skills when I was younger. And so once I started touching DJ and and DJing and, and, and hip hop, when hip hop came, it was like, Oh, you mean I can be really almost like an artist. I wasn't a rapper, none of that stuff. I'm like, but I can be like that probably even better because I can go through a whole lot of different genres and not be stuck. Yeah. And I get to allow people to escape by what I play. Yeah. Man, that was like, wow. Cause I knew music was always an escape for me. You know, when I was going through things in life, music, it was always there to soothe me and allow me to just kind of escape from stuff I was going through. And so I would imagine as a DJ, how many people that come in an environment that want to have that same experience for however many hours I'm playing. So I'm going to get in touch with people 
through music, and DJing was the best pl uh, platform for me. No doubt, no doubt. And then you um, have, you've also, I mean, you've connected with folk in the Portland metro area who are just doing things and really supporting the local scene. Um, I know that you and Star Child, shout out to Star Child, have yeah. done a lot of work together. I know you've done a lot of work with Cool Nuts. And so mm -hmm. you've seen sort of the Portland scene grow, yeah. you know, to where it is today. Yeah. Um, and then, again, have just stayed connected with, with those folk um, in, in real ways, not yeah. just on some like, oh, like, what's up? Like, like working with people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a big person on relationships. And, you know, I think of like me and Star. Uh, when I first met Star, the little dude, he was in high school. And I remember driving the car one day and this dude was like spitting freestyle for about an hour straight. Yeah. Just on everything he saw, didn't repeat nothing. I was just amazed by that dude. And f since I first met him, man, me and him have grown to be just f friends. I mean, he's like my family now. Yeah. Um, and I watch him go through his musical stuff now, being one of the top hosts, you know, around, period, yeah. uh, in terms of parties and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, him, you know, Cool Nuts. Remembering Kunas when I first came on the scene and having conversations with him and building relationships with him, uh, lifesavers. I mean, yeah. I could go live yeah. Warfield. All yeah. these people are like my friends. They're not like artists I know that just say, hey, "What's up?" You know, right. it's like these are people that call me. They come over the house and eat. You know, we yeah. hang out, different stuff like that. So yeah. I feel like that's very important as you grow. That's how networks grow. Yeah. You know, I, when I connect with an event. It's more than likely because someone and told somebody that was my friend that told me somebody else and told somebody else. And we just do that for each other. Right, right, right. DJ OG1, man. So um, you and I, you and I have, have, have known each other for a number of years and, and um, have had an opportunity to, to have you be a guest on, um, on some of the things that I've done. And mm -hmm. always been so grateful for that. And I've always just known you just as a such a such a real down to earth person, the stuff that I see yeah. you doing, the things that you've been recognized for doing in the community, right. in terms of building in the community, as well as the things that you do sort of on the on the entertainment scale, right. and all the things that we've already touched on. And I've always thought, wow, I mean, like knowing you personally, you're such a you're such a cool guy, right? And then seeing how you have such a heart for like real community service, right? That's just who you are, and it's something to celebrate. And then. Um, and then I had an opportunity to read The Man Behind the Music. <laughs> and it 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 all sort of kind of came together, you know, to yeah. really give me an understanding. So so for, for those who don't know, The Man Behind the Music is 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 your story. It's the story of DJ OG One. It's the right. story of David Jackson. Right. You know, kind of um your beginnings as a as a person. Right into moving to Oregon from from LA. Right. And everything that that sort of went into making you who you are. And and when I read the book and I and I you know definitely advise anybody to go out there and read it. I I, I told OG1 I I had an appointment that I had to go to <laughs> and if it hadn't been for that appointment I'd have read it all in one sitting because yeah. it's truly it truly captures captures you. Yeah. But um it also it, it takes you on this journey um, of someone who lived a life that doesn't even seem real. The things that you went through, the things that you experienced, right. and how you came out on the other side as such a, an amazing human being, you know, let alone a talented artist. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I want people to go and read the book, <laughs> but I just want to touch on a couple yeah. different things. Okay. Um, you know, your um, work in the community in terms of working with kids uh, came from your upbringing. Right. Um, you were, you were charged with, with that, with teaching kids and guiding kids and being there for kids and educating kids. Um, speak on, speak on that experience, how that, how that came about, what that was about for you. Well, for me, you know, um, you know, again, I'm hoping people will go and get the book and read even more in detail. But, um, you know, I got involved in gangs around 10 years old and just because of the neighborhood I grew up in, just kind of from a survival standpoint. Um, and when I was, you know, kind of uh, 
helped out of the situation, um, my immediately my immediate thought was I wanted to make sure I knew how I felt growing up not having a father, being in environments that even though you did not want the option of joining gangs, but that was just a survivor. If you didn't, I didn't have any big brothers. I didn't have any family around. So it was like, it was just me and my mother. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, who's going to protect me? Mm -hmm. And so it was like, this is, this was my choice. All my friends were gang members and stuff. And even though though my mom didn't know I was in gangs until I was grown, Mm -hmm. When she found out what you was, she had no idea because she was busy doing her thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once I got out, you know, it was just kind of a natural thing to want to be around young kids. And I could relate to young kids because they were closer to my age. And it was like, it was almost like uh, I wanted to transfer all the things that I've I had survived through up until that point to other kids and say, okay, you don't have to feel this way. I know what it's like not to have somebody to communicate with and just tell simple things like you're mad that day. Yeah. You're upset that day. Um, and so um, my mom got me involved in a church group, uh, which was Watts, uh, uh Inspired Temple initially, and then it transitioned into Watts Christian Center out of Los Angeles. And the pastor, Eldridge Roussard uh, Jr., uh, was the person that was instrumental in getting me out of the gangs. And he immediately kind of thrust me into uh, the environment with the kids that were a part of the church. And so I just hung out and, you know, became really kind of the popular guy because I was the oldest kid, a male kid in the uh, in that situation. So kids just kind of gravitated towards me. It went from that to um, when I got into sports, you know, I would train kids. I would train kids athletically, train them in track, basketball, uh, uh, general health, fitness. I used to do aerobics. The whole deal. Uh, and then it went from that training adults. Uh, when we um, uh, uh, partnered with uh, um, the NBA Pro-Am, I used to help train, uh, you know, pro athletes and stuff like that. Yeah, it got really intense, but kids was my thing. Yeah, Kids were my thing. And so I started working with kids and, and had worked with kids from the time I was like 15 on up to now yeah 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 yeah, absolutely yeah absolutely and that's one of the things that um i think it's important that people recognize is that um you were in a lot of ways groomed to to sort of have that heart but then as an adult you you've chosen to continue to to reach out to kids and create environments and atmospheres for them to be successful yeah because again i mean i understood the dynamics of of what happens in communities when you're not proactive. And so when I came to Portland, it was really motivating because I saw that Portland didn't have a lot of the, the uh, hardships, you know, in terms of on a large scale as, you know, Los Angeles. So for me, it was like, Oh, this is great. You know, let me, you know, get some kids up on, on game and, and let them know that they don't have to be like that. They don't have to follow those trends and, and things like that. Let me do my part. So I don't have to walk around and feel guilty and say when things happen to say, I just sat back and watch it happen. It was never about money for me. Uh, working in the community. It was never, I mean, of course, I had to take care of my, my wife and kids, but it was never about the money because I knew money would come. Yeah. You know, but it was always about making uh, a positive difference. Even, you know, when people see OG1, uh, I think the thing that separates me probably from every DJ probably in the game, and I'm just saying that, you know, not to be arrogant, but... Um, the reason why OG1 exists is because of the impact I want to have in the community. Yeah. I'm not interested in being the number one DJ or the top DJ just for status sake or anything like that. Yeah. My whole drive is the music industry influences our, our, our kids. You know, fame influences our kids, who they feel that are the popular people. And so... I looked at even my own kids and say, who will my kids listen to? Yes, it'd be great because I'm dad to listen to dad, you know, but the reality is my kids are 
around other environments. They go to school and they're at school and in that environment longer than they're at home. Yep. They come home, eat, we interact, do things as family. Then they go to sleep, get ready to go back to, to the challenges they face in school. So how was I going to be not only as a father to be able to be impactful to my kids, but how can I touch the arenas that they like and be a voice in that arena too? Yeah. Yeah. So music was my thing. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this music thing, yes, I love it. And I love to be able to allow people to escape. But at the end of the day, so what? What will my legacy be? Yeah. Would it be that I was a great DJ and, and made a lot of money and, and a lot of people thought I was popular? Yeah. Guess what? So what? That's that's to me, that's just beneficial for me and whoever is directly immediately associated with me. So for me, it was like, let me position myself and get a brand that's so strong that when I speak. Now, I finally have a platform to say something that is of substance. That's what's up. That's deep. And, and, and to have the to have the foresight to see that, I think I would imagine at least in part comes from the things that you experienced like what the, you didn't you didn't grow up in a traditional environment At you didn't all. grow up in a, in a traditional family environment you didn't grow up in a traditional school environment no. even beyond um the the introduction to 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 gang life and you know what what we all would typically consider a traditional family you didn't have that i didn't have it at all so you spoke on it you you mentioned it a little bit i mean you you were very involved in um in a church group in terms of the way you you came up living right. together um and had and 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 were witness to some things that were um not the norm right and uh and as a result of that um from a young age had a pretty big burden on you to 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 carry some things that you know they just don't even yeah. seem real yeah that yeah. just seem yeah you know out of the ordinary yeah yeah i mean how do you come out of a, a situation again hopefully people go get the book um you go from being taken from the streets to what's supposed to be a positive atmosphere you get into athletics you're out of trouble uh you're doing some positive things and you're doing community work, you're working with kids, you go from that being in newspapers and, and being this figure in, in, in a city like L.A. to your life totally crashing and being in the national spotlight as a cult. Which, which just like, again, people need to understand that... Um, I, you, you, I, it's, it's hard to even put yeah. it in the words, yeah. you know, yeah. to, to have that, to have your, like you said, the world, this is your life. This is the way that you live. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have not just the local, but the national, national media. media. Now you're a cult. Yeah. You're a cult. Your kids are taken away from you, put in foster care. Your mother is put in, in jail. Your brother's in foster care. You have nobody. The church that you grew up, that you were conditioned into that lifestyle with, you don't get support from them. They disappear. Now you're on the streets. And you have to make a decision. You worked in this group. Your money was in this group. Your life was about this group. Now you have to make a decision because the last thing you, you dealt with was the streets. Yeah. Now you're a grown adult and you're in Portland, Oregon. So do I go back to streets? Because now it's going to be more dangerous because now I'm equipped with knowing how to deal with people. Yeah. The dynamics of human, you know, uh, relation, human nature. I've, I've been taught all this stuff. Yeah. If I went to the streets in Portland, Oregon, I can do a lot of major. I can be good. Yeah. But I've been charged with this thing called the community and understanding how the streets impact lives. Yeah. 
And you have a spiritual conviction of you got this thing called God that you have a given, you're told to give an answer to. Yeah. So do I ignore that? At the same time, I have a woman that's looking at me like, what we going to do? Yeah. I had a decision. <laughs> exactly. And so my decision was I had to buckle down and say, you know, I can choose to let my circumstance dictate my outcome or I can choose the path that I want to go on. And I chose, nah, I'm not going to use the excuse because all the homies that I grew up with, they had all those excuses and I had more. Yeah. yeah. Anybody, if I would have went out and wild out in the streets and went up and started shooting up everything, going after the media, killing people, all that, because that's how I felt. Yeah. People would have understood. They were just like, he lost his mind. He was in that situation. He he lost it. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like, no, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to take everything that the world has thrown at me and say, I'm going to be the best person I can be. I'm not going to blame anybody. I'm going to take full responsibility and make it happen. Yeah. And that's why we're sitting here today. That's what's up. That's what's up. They, it, once again, I, not to sound like you know, sales pitch it out. You need to go get the book because there are there are amazing things in, in, in the book that make you ask the question, how did you um you know, when you talk about making the choice to take care of your family, I mean, you got a you got a big family, yeah, brother. You I know got six I mean? kids. Six, six wonderful kids. So there's there's that piece. Two two things that two things that stood out to me. One, you made a statement in the book and I didn't write it down. So I know I'm the, I know that I'm going to misquote you. But as you were talking about some of the things that you were experiencing and how you um, were able to uh, um, achieve some 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 great things, you made the statement something to the effect of, you know, there's 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 no excuse. There's there's no oh I can't do this because of no. Just you you can make the choice to rise. Above. It is a choice, man. You know, and again, this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about going out and speaking and getting involved in the community because you know just my life period and everybody has a story man i feel like the creator has tailor-made challenges and obstacles for every person's life so what might be you know deep and big in my life was just tailor-made for me and everybody has their own struggles in life but i think the thing that's constant and consistent across the board is that at the end of the day, you still have the choice of saying, do I want to use my circumstances and what life has thrown at, at me as an excuse to cop out and say, I quit yeah. and be good with that? Or will you take your circumstances, how crazy it is? how crazy it is and say, you know what? No, this is the thing that's going to launch me into being a better person. This is going to make me even greater than the average. Yeah. And that's what I chose, man. And that's how I live my life. And that's to me, OG one, the brand or whatever to me, everything that I do, I want to be able to push, put myself in the position to talk about this. Yeah. That's it for me. I don't care really about the money. I just want to be able to live and feed my family, take care of my responsibilities. I don't care about the riches and all that stuff. For me, I've been around rich people, yeah. been around millionaires, billionaires. Yeah. At the end of the day, they have to make the same choices as me because even with money, they have issues and problems and things they face. And they have to make choices even with money. Money only is giving them more options to do things. Yeah. But I'm more at peace in my life than some millionaires that I know. That's what's up. They wishing they had my life in terms of my outlook on life. Yeah. And so what that taught me was that, okay, man, every individual has to be encouraged and has to be given the information and start being around people that remind them of their self-value. My thing right now, my theme right now that when I go out and speak is about self-love forgiveness and positive choices. Yeah. I had to come to the point, even in writing that book, that book was an act of self-love for myself. 
I had to come to the point where I understand how valuable I was and how much love I'm worthy of. Yeah. And once I came to that understanding, then it was about forgiving myself for putting myself through turmoil by carrying all this weight and stuff I went through through my life and agonizing for what? Yeah. That didn't belong to me anymore. Yeah. I can make then the positive choice to move on in whatever direction I wanted to move on. It's people in my book I talk about from my mom, things she did, all that stuff. Me and my mom are good right now because yeah. I came to the place of loving me then being able to forgive me and then forgive her. Guess what? She did the best that she could. So I was able to forgive her because I could not believe in my life that my mom woke up, had me, and decided I want to make his life the worst it can ever be. Right. Right. And so once I was able to free myself from that and then free her, then, man, I'm open to whatever I want to do. I'm free. Yeah. I'm free, and the only time I'm not is whenever I allow the temptation to bring that bur those burdens back onto me. And so now, my mess that's my message, man. OG1 is about that. Yeah, I'm doing DJ and, and all that stuff, and that's great, but all that is to leverage the opportunity to tell people about this, man. So then the, the, the other thing that I wanted to touch on was, the other thing that I came away from that was um, very actually really amazing to me is, is you came... You you talk about the group that you were a part of that was a part of your life. It was um, a group that was the foundation of that group was religion or spirituality yeah. or however yeah. you want to you want to label that. And then coming through what you came through and then seeing how everything ended up, um, you have you've you've maintained that spiritual part of your life. Yeah. Where so many people would say they're, they're based on what I've seen and based on what I've experienced. If there is a God, then mm -hmm. this is not the God that I exactly. want to serve. Exactly. And, and, you know, coming from, you know, when I was younger, a very structured religious situation to being uh, a part of that would be considered non-denominational, non-really structured situation. Uh, seeing the pitfalls in the structured situation, I've seen everything, adultery. My mom had, you know, my brother from a pastor that was married. You know, so seeing all that, and I was bitter. I was like, oh, to hell with all this religious, you know, whatever they're doing. And then seeing what happened with the, you know, uh, the Ecclesia situation, it was kind of like, well, wow, man, what what's the thing that's going on with both of these situations? Because both of them is one extreme or the other. And both of them are, are talking about, quote, truth. Yeah. What I had to come to understanding about, man, is that, a lot of times people label human beings as the example of, of God. Right. And God don't have nothing to do with what are our, our flaws. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the truth being dictated by our flaws, whether or not they're valid or not. Yeah. It's just like, okay, does that mean a red light? You Somebody runs through the red light, that means it's no longer a red light stop sign anymore? <laughs> right, 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 right. Nah, because true. a lot of people run through it and ignore it and don't recognize it and say, hey, no, guess what? At some point, somebody's going to get caught and get penalized. It's still a red light. It doesn't change just because someone doesn't, you know, uphold it. Right. And what I found consistent across the board and I find in a number of, you know, churches. And again, this is not to take a jab at churches or anything like that. Uh, but it really this statement I'm getting ready to make is really to kind of say back up. Be, you know, don't be so hard on, on some of the churches because the pastor, whether it's the pastors or the people that's following, guess what? They're not God. Yeah. And the reason why some of them get so set up into, you know, you know, uh, you see pastors, you know, being criticized and they found, you know, doing something they're not supposed to. And now all of a sudden members leave. Guess what? That means they were following him. Right. And not following the truth. Right. And so stop following these people. Just follow the truth because human beings are going to be flawed. Me, myself, I can be sitting here talking all these truths. I can have a moment one day where I make a bad decision. Does that mean that the truths that I'm talking about are not true anymore? No, that just meant that day I didn't follow that truth and I have to be held accountable. And that's what's missing. People are not being held accountable. It's just assume, OK, he's the pastor. So everything he's doing, he's doing is just the truth. That's what's He's up. the example. 
Right. Oh, he can't have a bad day. Right. He can't make a bad de decision. Right. Guess what? Yeah, there's consequences for him being in that position or her being in that position to make a bad decision. But guess what? They got to be accountable not only to the people that they serve, but to God. But that doesn't mean, I mean, the gospel that I heard is, is the big word in it is called forgiveness. Yeah. And how many times we subtract that and say, no, you can't forgive them because they are a man of God or a woman of God or whatever. They're in leadership. Guess what? So was Peter. Yeah. Peter denied Christ three times. Yeah. And he saw things. How many of us, if we saw people being raised from the dead and all that stuff, would have been like, <laughs> I'm going to say, I don't even know that dude. Right, right. right. So that should have set an example that, guess what? We're flawed as people. The beauty about community is that we're supposed to have an environment, man, where even the weakest member in our, our community to the strongest, we have a system of accountability. To me, I think that's the biggest reason why our communities have lost that sense of village. It's because nobody wants to hold anybody accountable. Yeah. They want to talk about people and talk about what's wrong, but no one wants to be accountable to what is your responsibility in the community. Oh, let's put it off on the police. Yeah. They're supposed to keep our communities together and all that stuff. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. They're the scapegoats. We ain't doing our job. That's why they have to come in. But then when they are flawed... <laughs> we want to hold them accountable. Right. But when we're flawed, right. we don't want to hold us accountable. Yeah. So, yeah, I can I talk all day about that <laughs> that stuff, so, man. man. DJ OG one, brother, we got like we we going to have to uh, we gonna have to do this again <laughs> yeah, for real, part for real. 2. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um you were, you were involved in so many things, man. Let everybody know um, like the, the simplest way to, to follow what's going on in, you know, in your schedule? Most definitely, uh, you could follow uh, my website. I post events and things that I'm doing quite often at djog1.com, as well as follow me on Twitter at djog1, as well as Instagram, djog1. And uh, just, you know, I appreciate all the support. Um, I always tell people, people that... You know, in supporting OG1, it's not about me. If you believe that I'm genuine about the things I'm doing in the community, you think that there are positive uh, uh, things that need to be heard, then I tell people by supporting me and, and speaking upon me in a positive way only enhances my uh, ability to uh, be able to uh, get that message out. Uh, again, the DJing and, and all that stuff, celebrity, all that stuff. I, I, I'm I telling you the secret now. That's a smoke screen. <laughs> I'm telling you now. I'm, I, that's the smoke screen for what you're really hearing right here. Uh, opportunities to, you know, pass on pass on positive information and, uh, and encouragement. That's what's up. DJ LG1. Check them out. DJLG1.com. There's also going to be a link on the DJ Cliff website. Because, um, you know, like you said, man, we're all about building community. And, uh, you know, and, and just having an, a positive impact in the footprints that we leave behind. So once again, my brother, thank you so much. Thank you for and, the uh, opportunity, my brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go get it. The man behind the music. It's an amazing read. And uh, God willing, we'll be, we'll be together again soon. All right, y'all. Peace.